with science! Ten o'clock, how we doing today? Good to see you guys. Welcome, glad that you're here for week two of God Blinded Me with Science. Today I'm going to be talking about one of your favorite topics. I'm going to be talking about you. You, you, you. Just look around for one minute and look at all the yous in the room today. Just look at you. There's so many yous in the church today. Just look around. And isn't it fascinating that you put the you in unique? You are unique. There's nobody else like you. You. Here's what I want you to do. This is going to be really awkward. It's going to be awesome. Just kind of pick somebody out in the room that you don't know and just look at them. Just pick somebody out and just kind of stare at them for a minute. Just kind of do it. Look around. Now, you don't have to say anything because I'm going to tell you what you're thinking. You're thinking one of two things right now. You're either thinking, wow, they are a really normal, nice person, or you're thinking, Yep, they've got somebody locked in their basement. It's one of those two things. <laughs> we are all unique. We are all different. In fact, the Bible says that you are uniquely and wonderfully made. There's only one you. You may look like somebody. You may talk like somebody. You may even act like somebody, occasionally smell like somebody. But there is only one you. Why? Because you have this thing in you that God's placed in you called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, if you will. It's a long molecule, a genetic material that makes you, you. Everyone has it. Think of it like this. It is a genetic alphabet that makes up countless words that writes the story of your life. And every living thing has DNA, whether you're a pineapple, a porcupine, or a person, you have DNA. It's what makes you, you. You are unique. But isn't it interesting that in spite of how unique you are, how different, how peculiar sometimes that you are, we all have, I believe, this insatiable desire to change who we are. How do I know that? People say, oh, I don't like change. No, we do like change, because if we didn't like change, we wouldn't spend 30 billion, with a B, dollars a year in the cosmetic industry. 20 billion dollars alone in cosmetic surgery. What does that mean? It means you get your tummy tucked, your face lifted, hair taken away from places that you don't want it, added to places that you do want it. You want certain things smaller, certain things larger. We want to change who we are. And I believe the only thing that's greater than the desire to change who you are on the outside is the desire to change you on the inside. Because you know you. You know every regret that you have. You know everything that you said that you wish you wouldn't have. Everything that you've done that you wish you had a do-over. Every mistake that you made. Every thought that you've had that's been Something that you thought, how could a person like me ever think something like this? You know you. In fact, the Bible talks about that inward me in Jeremiah 17, 9. It says the human heart, another translation says mind, is the most deceitful of all things. It is incurable. No one understands how deceitful it really is. We all have this desire to change on the inside because we know who we are. Is it possible? I know I can change my outside, but I'm not crazy about some of the choices that I've made. Can I change my inside? Is there anything that I can do on the inside that will make me less like who I was? And I want to look today for some answers, and I believe there's one that we're going to find in the book of Luke. It's in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. He was a physician. He's got a fascinating take on the way that he records history and what he saw and heard. And I believe there's an answer on how we can change the inner me in the book of Luke. It'll be on the screen behind me if you don't have a Bible. It says Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. It's a story about Jesus and a small man named Zacchaeus. 
And here's the story. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. And he was the chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was physically challenged. He was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road for Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by his name and he said, Zacchaeus, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. And Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus in his house and with great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. It says that he has gone to be the guest of a, uh-oh, notorious sinner. They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and he said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. This man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. Today, I want to talk to you about three ways that I believe will help you change on the inside. Let's pray together as we get into the Word of God. Father, thanks today for your people and your house where we come together to be more like Jesus. God, I pray that in this time that we have together, God, that you really reveal to us not necessarily who we are, but the potential that we have to be. Jesus, help me communicate this in a way that no one is left out. We know that your Word is personal and it's designed for everyone. Help me communicate it in a way that everyone gets it and experiences life change in your house today. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Everyone said amen, amen and amen. Life change. The first thing, and if you're taking notes, write this down. I believe before life change happens, you have to be curiously motivated. Curiously motivated. Isn't it interesting? It's not every day that the city's most prominent businessman feels the urge to leave his office and go out and shimmy up a tree to get a look at a traveling evangelist. But there was something about Jesus that made him curious that he wanted to leave his everyday life and say, wait a minute, this is important enough for me that I get a look at him. Curious. Who is this guy? The Bible says... He tried to get a look at Jesus. He was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road. For Jesus was going to pass that way. He was curious. What if I could see him? What if I could talk to him? See, because he knew who Jesus was. See, Jesus was a rock star back in the day. Jesus was drawing large crowds. People were talking about him. His reputation preceded him. And wherever Jesus was, things happened. People were there. They wanted him to get a glimpse of this miracle man. And Zacchaeus knew about this. And he was curious. And he thought, what if? Have you ever had a what if moment in your life? Like, what, what if things weren't always the way that they've been? What if something could change in my life? He was curious. He had a what if experience that caused him to go out of his house. Maybe you're curious today. Maybe you're here simply because you're curious about what's been happening here. You drove by and you saw all the traffic and you thought, what is going on in that place? I've got to go check it out. I'm curious. Maybe you're curious because you've talked to somebody that came here and you've seen a difference in their life and you thought, hmm, if it happened to them, just maybe it could happen to me. You're, you're curious Curious about maybe, just like Zacchaeus, seeing Jesus today. And it's interesting because I believe life change begins with being curious. But write this down if you're taking notes. Don't miss this. Life change begins with curiosity, but life change isn't activated until you're motivated to do something about it. It begins with being curious but it isn't activated until you're motivated to actually do something about it. Second Thessalonians 3.10 said, The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. What does that mean? You can be curious about losing weight, but until you put down the ho-hos and get on the treadmill, guess what? It's not going to happen. 
you can be curious about what would it be like if me and my sister started to talk again because there's been a period of years that we've just kind of separated me and my mom, me and my dad, me and my friend. I'm curious what that would be like to have that relationship restored, but I promise you it won't happen until you pick up the phone and make a call. You can be curious, but until you activate your motivate, nothing will change. You can be curious about seeing your health change. You fill in your blank, but you have to activate your motivate in order to see something change. So you need to perceive a need. See, I believe Zacchaeus perceived a need in his life. He knew something wasn't in alignment. He, 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 and it seemed that he had it all, didn't he? He was wealthy. He had, he had money. It seemed that he was doing well. He had a good job. Everything was good. But he perceived the need that there was a gap in his life, and he was curious enough to come out of his norm, out of his office, climb up, to, up a tree. See, sometimes you have to put yourself in a new position to get a different perspective. He saw things from a different perspective. He perceived a need. Maybe you're here today and you perceive a need in your life. That there's just something that's out of alignment. Not exactly the way that you hoped it would be. And you're curious about what would it be like if it could change. See, because on the outside, the thing that people see, it seems like it's all okay. And you do a great job of kind of maintaining the outside. See, but the, the real issue is you know you're inside. And you know every area of your life that's broken every area of your life where you're hurting, every area of your life where there's a gap between where you are and where God wants you to be. See, life change happens when, when you're curious, but you don't see a result until you're actually motivated to do something about it. And I believe the next step is sometimes you just have to be urgent. There's an urgency involved when it comes to life change. I don't know about you, but I've been urgent before. Linda and I were driving back from Morgantown, and a normal trip from Morgantown is about an hour. And I have it worked out. I can drink about three cups of coffee and get back from Morgantown to Wheeling. But see, sometimes things happen in your life that you don't plan on, and it changes everything. And see, there was construction on the way back. <laughs> and suddenly, there was something that was so urgent in my life, I did not know what I was going to do unless something happened. Have you ever been there? Urgent. What does urgent mean? It can't wait. Linda, pull the car over. I can't wait any longer. Something has to give here. And I believe this is exactly where Zacchaeus was when he left his house. He realized there was a desperate need in his life and he was urgent. And not only was he urgent to get up the tree to get a look at Jesus, it's fascinating to me that Jesus was urgent to get a look at him because he said, Zacchaeus, quick, come down. Quick, come down. Don't wait another moment. I want to be a guest in your house. What's urgent in your life? What have you been putting off that God wants you to put on? Because I promise you this, procrastination will keep you from your destination. And there are things that you've been putting off for way too long that God's been calling you to do that you need to step into your position, step into your potential, and begin to live the life that God has called you to. Listen, procrastination will keep you from your destination. Don't wait one more moment. And the other interesting thing about this text is Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I want to be a guest in your home. It's fascinating to me that Jesus is always a guest. He's never an intruder because an intruder goes where he's not wanted, but Jesus only goes where he's invited. What area in your life do you urgently need to invite Jesus to be a guest in? What area in your life are you saying, I can't wait one more moment. I need to invite Jesus into my struggle and I need to invite him in today. Because I believe that's exactly where Zacchaeus was. And I believe that's exactly where Jesus wanted to go. 
What area do you need to invite Jesus in? Maybe you're here today and you need to invite Jesus into your marriage. Maybe you do marriage and you do it pretty well, but by God somewhere out here and he's not in the middle of where you are in your marriage. What other area do you need to invite Jesus into? Maybe if you're a young person today, you need to invite him into your school. That Jesus would be with you in your school. Maybe you need to invite Jesus into your finances because you're struggling financially. There's a gap. There's an area in your life that you just haven't invited him because he's a gentleman. He only goes where he's invited. He's never an intruder. He'll only be there when you invite him in. There's an urgency today, I believe, for so many of us to invite Jesus into a place where we have a gap in our life. Don't wait one more moment. Today is the day to invite Jesus in to your situation, to invite him in to whatever area that's broken. See, sometimes I think we just need to be desperate. <laughs> And maybe that's where you are today. That there's been a desperation in your life. And you've just been putting this thing off. And you know in your heart right now exactly what it is. And, and you're desperate for something. And, and you've just been kind of sweeping this thing under the rug. I would say don't wait one more moment. I would say today's a great day, a great opportunity for you in the middle of your struggle, in the middle of your addiction, in the middle of your mess, in the middle of your adultery, in the middle of your lie, in the middle of your broken inside life, invite Jesus into your struggle. Listen, it's urgent. It's urgent. Third point. Just do it. You're curiously motivated, right? Curiously motivated. It's urgent. Now, you just have to do it. See, yesterday you said tomorrow, well, that's today. <laughs> yesterday you, you said tomorrow, that, that's today. Zacchaeus and Nike were on the same page, just do it. Look, look to the person beside you and smile and say, just did it, thank you very much. <laughs> just did it. Some people, you were smiling way too big when you said just did it, by the way. I don't know what your Sunday morning looks like, but mine doesn't look like that. Verse 8, meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. And if I had cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. One more thing to write down. Don't miss this. Life change just doesn't happen because Jesus did something. It happens when you do something in response to what Jesus did. Life change just doesn't happen because Jesus did something. It happens when you respond to the thing that Jesus did. What is the response that Zacchaeus did? He said, I'm going to pay back everybody that I've ever ripped off. I I'm going to change the alignment in my life. I'm going to make things right. What does that mean? It means he repented. He repented. Christian word. We hear it all the time. Repent, repent, repent. After repent. What does it mean? It simply means you do what Zacchaeus did. And you turn away from the thing that you were doing and you start down a different path. You change the way that you thought about a different thing. It means to change the way that you've thought about a thing in your life. It means that you go in a different path. I've got a great word for somebody today. Don't like the direction that you're going? Turn around. Turn around. Repent. Turn around. Go in a different direction. And that's exactly what Zacchaeus did. He, he was this greedy little cheat, and now suddenly he's a generous little man. Generous little man because of an encounter with Christ. And he didn't waste time. He just did it. I want to tell you, there's people in the room, and, and you've made, listen to what I'm going to tell you. Don't make an idol out of your prayer life. Because some of you have been praying 
for so long, and God's already given you the answer, and now you're using it as, a, as an excuse, and you've just continued to pray and pray, and God's already told you to do it. Listen, you don't need to pray anymore. You just need to do it. You just need to do it. You just need to do it. Let me ask you a question, a good question for you, a good question for me. What do you need to stop doing that you are doing? What do you need to start doing that you're not doing? Great question for me, great question for you. What do you need to stop doing that you know that you shouldn't be? You know right now. What do you need to start doing that God's called you to that you've been putting off? Because procrastination will keep you from what? Your destination. Move. Don't wait. Isn't it interesting that Jesus could see the potential in this wealthy, little, greedy cheat called Zacchaeus? And he sees past where he is, and he sees the potential that can be, and says, invite me into your struggles, Zacchaeus, and I can change who you are. And what I want to say is, if he can do it for Zacchaeus, he can do it for you. And there's some of us here today that we look at our life and we're like, wow, I, I know me way too well. And maybe you've thought this before, how can a God that knows me so well still love me so much? How can a God that cares so deeply about me yet know really what's inside of me? But I want you to know today that God specializes in taking broken things and putting them back together. And Jesus saw Zacchaeus' readiness for salvation. He saw his readiness for salvation. There's nothing more urgent than salvation. Nothing more urgent than salvation. There's another Christian word, salvation. What does it mean? Well... If I were to ask most Christians what salvation means, it means that you get to spend eternity with God. And I would say, that's part of it. That's a great part. But that's not all there is to that word. See, that's actually a Greek word, and it's called sozos. Everybody say sozos. Sozos. Salvation is sozos. And sozos is not limited to just eternity with God. It also means that you're protected from harm. It also means that you're rescued. It also means that you're made whole. It also means that you're put back together. And salvation is this continuing change that Jesus brings into our life now when we invite him in to our situation. See, Jesus wants to give you the power to live in right relationship with God and each other now. Jesus wants to take your brokenness and make it wholeness now. Jesus wants to give purpose to your life now and he wants to invite you on a mission with him to seek and save that which is lost. And it starts with Sozo's salvation. How do we get it? Well, it's actually pretty simple. God has made access to him one of the simplest things that you'll ever do. It's simply inviting Christ into your life and believing what he did on the cross paid for the sin that separated you from God. See, your sin has separated you. It's caused a gap between you and God. Remember at the beginning we said on the inside we all have stuff. That sin has kept us from being who God wants us to be. And God is here and we're here. But Jesus comes. He bridges the gap. He pays the ultimate sacrifice for your sin. Crucified. Raised on the third day. And all we simply do is believe by faith that he did what he said he did. And we invite him into our struggle. We invite, listen, salvation into our life. We invite Sozo because salvation is found in only one man, in Jesus. And when you invite Jesus into your life, you're inviting Sozos into your life and you're inviting redemption.
redemption into your life. And you're inviting forgiveness into your life. And you're inviting wholeness into your life. And you're inviting love into your, your life. And things begin to change. Now listen, because it's about to get really good. <laughs> Re rewind. Go, go, go clear back. DNA. DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA. That is the chemical scientific understanding of DNA. But see, when sozos happens, there's something greater that happens in your life. And when you invite God into your life, suddenly you're not who you used to be. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this, anyone that belongs to Christ is a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Listen, DNA may have stood for deoxyribonucleic acid, but once you invite Christ into your life, it no longer stands for that. Now it stands for my old life does not apply. Come on, you're not who you were. You're somebody different. God's changed your life. Amen. You're somebody different. God's redeemed you. Let's celebrate the goodness of God. You're not who you were anymore. Your old life is gone. It's not just covered over. God's just not covered it. He's taken it away. He's done something different in your life. He's redeemed you. Don't let the devil lie to you one more day about your past. It's not who you are. It's not what you've done. Come on. You are new in Christ. Let's celebrate. That's good news. Wow. Wow. That's good news. My old life does not apply. In the name of Jesus, everybody repeat this after me. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself just for me. Let's pray together and ask that you bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, thank you today for doing what only you can do, providing life change on the inside. And if you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for one moment, I believe there's people that walked in here before and maybe you, you, you were following Jesus and you were, you were a Christian, but you've been carrying around this baggage for so long that you just need to let go of today because it's not who you are anymore. That some of you have, have fear about, maybe it's about your kids, maybe it's about your finances, maybe it's about your health, maybe it's about your future, maybe it's about an addiction, maybe it's about a, an abuse that occurred years ago, but you, there's been a thing in your life that you can't let go of. And I'm going to tell you today in the name of Jesus that Sozos is in this room and people are being set free through the power of of the Holy Spirit. And if that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to receive sozos today, just put your hand up and say, that's my life today. Wow, that's my life today. Sozos, salvation has come into my home. I'm inviting salvation into my home today. Hands up all over the room, hands still going up. If your hands up today, congratulations that your life will never be the same, that you're a different person, that Jesus has come into your life right now by faith and he's rescuing you, he's making you whole, he's healing you, he's changing your mind and you're not who you were in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you for what you're doing. You're doing what only you can do with here in our church, that, that you're growing us, God, that, that your body is expanding. We know that our church is never too big if there is still one that is lost. God, we just continue to, to, to pray your favor in this house. God, that it would be a place of life change, a, a place where we're not who we used to be, not because of anything that we've done, but because of everything that Jesus has done. And, and we believe with all of our hearts today that because the tomb is empty, that the best is yet to come. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You guys can have a seat. God bless you guys today.